So now we're going to model what a, an example would look like. So the book is really well organized in terms of how it's asking you the questions. So we're going to look at number eight, which I took the time to type out here for you. And that way we can just be looking at the screen. But this is 9.1 number eight, and we have some information. So take a look at the very last sentence. Use a 0 0.05 significance level to test the claim that Burger King and McDonald's have the same accuracy rates. Okay, so a rate is a proportion. And so let's go write our claim. Our claim in symbols. Well, how do we write that? So we're going to have to pick, in terms of the notation that they use in the book, we're going to have to pick somebody to be number one and number two. So I usually just let the first thing they talk about be number one. So if we look at Burger King, That could be number one. And what we found out is that they had 264 orders that were accurate and 54 that were not accurate. So notice that they're asking about accuracy rates. So the number of accuracy orders, and I'm using a subscript one because I'm going to call Burger King population number one. And the number of accuracy rates was 264. Now the total number of orders looked at is not even on the screen. I'm going to have to add up some numbers. I'm going to have to take my 264 that were accurate and tack on the 54 that were not accurate for 318. Those numbers will help me. There's also the McDonald's, right? We'll call that number two. And so McDonald's had a number of accurate orders as 329 out of a total of, well, let's take the 329 and add the 33 and get 362. Now I put a whoops, I put a subscript 2 under there because they're my second population. Notice that there's no overlap between Burger King and McDonald's. They're two completely independent organizations and we're comparing their rates. So what we're claiming is that they have the same accuracy rates. So our claim is that the the percentage of accurate orders from Burger King is the same as the percentage of accurate orders from McDonald's. So any one represents Burger King, any two represents McDonald's. Capital P means the percentage of all orders ever taken. Right? And so what's our null hypothesis? Well, it's the exact same thing. P1 equals P2. Well, our alternative hypothesis, it loves to be the claim, but this is, like you saw in chapter 8, one of the times, one of the small amount of times that it can't be because it can't be the same as the null hypothesis and so we always pick the opposite. And so we have this nice two-tailed test. We already know all about it. Now what's our test statistic look like? Our test statistic looks like this. P1 hat minus P2 hat minus P1 minus P2 all over the square root of p bar q bar all over n1 plus p bar q bar all over n2. So that's our formula and we know a lot of those numbers. Um, the most confusing piece might very well be, and let me come in and highlight it in yellow, this p1 minus p2. These are population symbols and if you remember we got our population symbols by the number that was in the statement of the null hypothesis. Well there is no number and but if you remember from the overview you're always doing a direct comparison and so if I were to solve let me uh, erase this arrow so I have some room if I were to solve and get this p1 p2 on the one side I'd have p1 minus p2 is equal to zero if I subtracted p2 this guy right here this p1 minus p2 is always zero in every single one of your problems and the reason why it's always zero is because they're always doing just a straight comparison between the two your null hypothesis will always be p1 equals p2 and because of that if you were to bring over the p2 by subtracting it to both sides you'd have a number zero and it's a number that needs to go in there so if you remember, I was a little bit hesitant about what I was going to write, but I decided that I was going to write exactly what they had in the book. So let's go in here and start pulling some things out. They model in the book when you look at the examples, and we'll do the same thing. Um, 
not rounding off at all in this process. And so what is P1? P1 hat, apologize. P1 hat is the percentage of accurate orders coming out of the sample from Burger King. And that was 264 out of 318. They'll do that because they don't want any round off error. Minus. And so I'll put this in a bracket because this is the first bracket. Minus in parentheses the percentage of accurate orders at McDonald's which was 329 out of 362 were accurate. And then just for emphasis this is zero. So this second zero let me go back and highlight in yellow. This zero corresponds directly to this, which is always zero, right? So if you look at a formula sheet that I have for chapter nine that's posted on Canvas, it won't even have the P1 minus P2 because it's always zero. Now I'm stuck. I got to do some side work because P bar and Q bar are not found yet. Let me check something out really quick. Let's see what this 264 divided by 318 is. If it's simple and truncates, we can just write that, but it's not. It's 0.83 and it goes on forever. They're recommending, and I will only model doing it direct, I'm sorry, doing it with no round off. And I'll try the other one. Nope, that's 90% and some change, and we need to keep all that change. So what's P bar? Well, P bar's formula, like you saw in the last, if you looked at the overview video or that you saw as you read through the book on the very first page of instruction, right? On that page 416, P bar is, I don't care whether you're from McDonald's or whether you're from Burger King, what was the percentage of accurate orders? And we got to figure that out. So let's go find these numbers. That's a 264 accurate from Burger King, 329 accurate from McDonald's. That's over 318 plus 362. And so we'll go look at that and see what that pooled estimate is. Doesn't matter whether you're from McDonald's or from Burger King. We just want to know the number of accurate orders. And so it's a lengthy process. Let me try this 593 divided by 680. Probably won't be nice. It's not. And so we're going to put that 583 divided by 680 here. You'll do less work keeping the fractions. A majority of, the, well, you'll do less work keeping the fractions. I can say that overall. Um, so you can think that you'd be wonderful to write down eight decimal places, but the translation will be harder. So there's P hat. What's Q hat? Well, oops, sorry, P bar. Q bar is 1 minus P bar. Well, what's that? That's 1 minus 593 over 680, written as a fraction. So what is that? Just to make sure we're all okay. That's 680 over 680 minus 593 over 680. And so if I take 680 minus 593, I get 87 over 680. So what Q hat Q bar really is, it's the makeup to one, so it's 87. If there's 583 orders that were accurate out of the total of 680, then there's 87 that are not accurate. That's what Q bar is, it's the other half. And then that's all over N1, which was 318. Then it's the same numbers, it's a plus under here. 583 over 680, all times 87 over 680 all divided by 362. And so that's our test statistic formula. So to keep everything nice, I'm going to start erasing this P bar, Q bar. If you're upset by that, don't be, because you can just go back in the video. Super awesome. Okay, it's not like a whiteboard in class. So maybe you like that a little bit better. This is definitely the lengthiest process out of every process you'll do in nine is what we're doing here. So let's see if we can plug it in. We're going to be very, very careful. We're going to take 264 divided by 318, subtract away 329 divided by 362, and then we're going to hit equals. That'll be our top one. I'm looking at a number, but I'm not going to write it down. That looks like negative 0.078, and then it just keeps going 86511. That means there's a 7% difference between the two, almost 8% difference. I'm going to hit divide by, 
and I'm going to get my square root and just type in what I see. 583 divided by 680 times 87 divided by 680 divided by 318. Nothing special that you have to use. Use no parentheses whatsoever. Plus 583 divided by 680 times 87 divided by 680 divided by 362. And then you're going to hit equals. And we get a z value of negative 3.089. So I'm going to put 3.09. Now, just like in chapter 8, you can look over and you can get reinforcement over all of the values that you have. And I'm seeing the back of the book answer agrees with mine. Uh, negative 3.09. It's perfect. There was no round off error in there because I never put the decimal approximations of all these fractions. So that's the longest piece. Now the rest of it's pretty nice. You know that it's two-tailed test. And so because it's two-tailed, um, we're, we're going to split up our significance level. Our significance level was 0 0.05. So you know this is 0 0.025 and this is 0 0.025. We're going to look it up and get a negative 1.96 and 1.96 out of that. We can look and see if our critical values are right in the back of the book, and they are. And now we're doing the exact same thing. The negative 3 is in the tail area. It's in the bottom tail area. So we're going to reject the null hypothesis. And there is sufficient evidence Two, and let's go look. Our claim is the same as the null hypothesis. So to warrant rejection of the claim. That, and then I'm going to go look at what the claim was. That Burger King and McDonald's have the same accuracy rates. So they do not have the same accuracy rates is what we just found out because we rejected that. Awesome. That's part A. Kind of All that work for part A. It feels like a lot because we're talking through it. And then once you're set um, in all of this, like once you start to do some problems, it becomes pretty quick in, in all of that. But there is a part B. A part B that says test the claim by constructing an appropriate confidence interval. Well, an appropriate confidence interval would have the same 1.96 and negative 1.96. So for part B, we're establishing the 95% confidence interval. Well, we know what to do there. Now, it's the confidence interval for the difference. Okay, P1 minus P2. I want to get that confidence interval for the difference. And the reason why we do the difference is because it tells us a lot, right? We can know whether things are the same or not. Because if P1 minus P2 is equal to zero, then the two things are the same. So let's see what we get out of this. If it's a confidence interval for P1 minus P2, and they always are for the difference, we're always going to start out with P1 minus P2 and add and subtract some error. And it's that error that we want. Now, P1 hat, well, what's that? P1 hat was a 264 out of 318. Okay. And P2 hat, what was that? I can look over here. It was, actually, I'll come back up here. It would be better. 329 out of 362. And we're going to add and subtract some error from that. That error is going to be a z alpha over 2 number times the square root of p1 hat q1 hat all over n1 plus p2 hat q2 hat all over n2. That's our error formula. Well, it's 95% confident, so we're still going to use the 1.96. So you don't even need, I don't think the book's asking you to name. Oh, they are. They're asking you to name that confidence interval. So that's great. I'll expect the same thing on the exam. P1 hat, 264 out of 318. Q1 hat would be the number of inaccurate orders. Well, how many inaccurate orders were there? 
for McDonald's, there were 54 that were not accurate. So 54 out of 318. Notice the two of those added together would be 318 over 318. And that's all being divided by 318, as weird as that feels. Plus, and now we have the 329 out of 362. And then times 33 out of 362 would be the Q1 hat. Again, 1 minus uh, Q2 hat. And so N2 would be um, 362. So a lot of work for this, for both of these problems. I thought I would just do it together. Hopefully it's not overwhelming. Shouldn't be because you could pause the video. But let's go see what our error is. 1.96 times the square root of 264 divided by 318 times 54 divided by 318 divided by 318 plus 329 divided by 362 times 33 divided by 362 divided by 362 and we'll hit equals and we get an error of 0 0.0508160056 now these are our end answers so we're welcome to round so we're almost done we need to take this error and add and subtract it from the um, from the P1 hat minus P2 hat. So let's go do that. Let's take this and translate it down here. So let's take the 264 divided by 318 minus 329 divided by 362 and hit equals and we see that same value that we saw in the numerator of the test statistic. Now here we're welcome to round it. So I'll go to three significant digits. So 0 0.07865 so I'll put 787 and we're going to add and subtract from that and I'll go the same distance out 0 0.0508 and we'll subtract so we'll take our negative 0 0.0787 and subtract away the 0 0.0508 number and we end up with negative 0 0.1295 less than P1 minus P2. Remember, you're getting the um, confidence interval for the difference of the two population proportions. And I'll go change that to a plus. And we get negative 0 0.0279. And then we can go and check that in the back of the book. And they, they have the exact same values in there. They've rounded theirs a little bit differently. Um, but it agrees totally with what was just said. Notice we're staying, no, well, here's what you should notice. Does, um, I mean, not word does. Let me say, can P1 minus P2 be equal to zero? And the answer is no. That's the question you want to ask yourself. If it can't be equal to zero, that's awesome. Because if P1 minus P2 does not equal zero, then P1, well, actually, let me word it differently. It might be better. If P1 minus P2, why do we care about it being zero? If P1 minus P2 is equal to zero, it means that P1 is equal to P2. The only way to subtract two numbers and have them be zero is if they're the same or if you added P2 to both sides. Well, this is always the null hypothesis. And we just found out, nope, it can't do that. We just found out we're rejecting the fact that they could be the same. P1 minus P2 can't be equal to zero. Why am I saying that? Because look where it's bound. It's bound on the left side of zero. It won't be any less than negative 12.9, negative 0.1295, and it won't be any more than 0.279. But look how much more information we get. Now we're we're technically done with all of, with our problem. That would be the confidence interval, and it totally agrees with the testing of hypothesis done in A, as it always will. Here's what you know more. Remember what P1 was. P1 was the Burger King. Ah, get a pen back here. P1 was the the proportion of ac. Well, it was the accuracy rate. That would be a better way to, for me to say that. It was the accuracy rate. 
at BK, at Burger King, right? P2 was the accuracy rate, accuracy rate at McDonald's. And what we're finding is P1 minus P2 is negative, which means that McDonald's has a higher uh, accuracy rate. It could be by as little as 2.79%, but maybe as high as almost 13%. Right, so you get so much more information from a uh, confidence interval than you do for a, a testing of hypothesis. A testing of hypothesis, when we do that, just says, yeah, they're not the same. This one tells us not only are they not the same, but it's the McDonald's one that is more accurate, and it could be as much as 13% more accurate, but definitely above about 2.8% accuracy. So, pretty cool and what they're able to do. So that's a fully worded problem or fully worked problem from this section. And the workload doesn't change. It's like this throughout the section. So you'll become comfortable with it. That's why I'm giving you a full week to do just these two sections. You'll have the following week to do some more 9.3 and to wrap up the 9.2 issues. Uh, and then we'll take our exam. So there's still lots of time for this to sit.